you've done the presentation, don't forget you got to turn it just like CJ did here. This is perfect. So it's like the job, CJ. The description, exactly. <laughs> we, we had to submit it like that? Not in advance, but within a week of doing it. So let's say before next Thursday class, just turn in your script with and with a link. I was going to give you this. It has, it has the... Um, Does it have the link on it? It has the, the site and then what you type in to find it. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, That's good. It has the article title. Yeah, I can take that. Okay, yay. That's good. Uh, we'll come back. Hey, Julian. Good, good. All right. Oh, uh, and there is... Uh, a new prompt. There is a uh, streaming video prompt. So, um, just to bring it to your attention, come on, research paper two, open. So there it is, it says new. Only a few years ago, streaming video was touted as a savior technology that would free audiences from the bloated bundles and spiraling fees imposed by cable TV providers. So, so remember, this is, I promised you uh, a prompt about uh, streaming for our final research paper. So there it is, new and hopefully useful. Uh, but I'm just thinking maybe you guys want to get the presentation out of the way before. Let's, let's do that, and then we'll come back and talk about research paper two when everyone is relieved and with a clear mind as to what they want to do. OK, so um, the way our industry news presentation works is there's an X on the spot here, and Jody is going to give you a nice, not a close-up, but I hope a medium shot. We have here our uh, microphone. So you actually have to hold this pretty close in order to be understood. So, you know, pretend you're a singer, some of you are, and hold it up close uh, when you do your thing. And as I said, you're welcome to read your thing. Absolutely okay. Jody? And I was just going to say, you can turn it on and leave it on until okay. the presentations are done. So Sweet. Don't worry about it. Okay, so don't worry about turning it off or anything. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I'm just going to go and sort of, we'll move from the back of the class, which makes Julian, you'll be first here. <laughs> Good news for you. Sorry. Good news for oh, you. I am last so, first out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And be sure to tell us, you know, make sure we know what, what organization you're talking about with okay. you. So, so I wanted to look at like Spotify, but every time I was looking at Spotify, I just kept coming into Apple Music, because you know Spotify kind of has had the monopoly on paid subscriptions as well as like free subscriptions for music streaming, but because Apple Music is on like, like 900 million phones around the world, it's like Apple's already pre-programming it in. And so the article I found was on CNBC. This was posted on like April 15th of this year because Apple just surpassed Spotify for paid subscribers in the US. So like at the end of February, it was like Spotify had 26 million and Apple Music at 28 million. And so it's just, it's just a shakeup because already there's so many issues behind Spotify not really paying their art, not really paying their artists mostly because of the free subscription and so you know they have a lot of those ads running but people don't want to hear ads they just want to hear the music and so they you know if you have an iphone it's real easy to just pay for the apple music real quick and everything's already in your phone it gets transferred through that one cloud and although you know apple verizon for example says sells bundles where you get like free apple music with whatever service you pay for spotify kind of has that going on with sprint and also a Samsung, but it's not really to the same degree of popularity. I mean, you know, it's just the US that, um, that Apple Music is more popular than Spotify. Uh, around the world, Spotify still has 207 million subscribers, so it's, it's a lot more. But that gap is rapidly getting short. And Spotify actually uh, filed an antitrust complaint to the European Commission against Apple, something involving their app store. You know, in the article, they didn't really explain it too well, but something about how their app is not getting out there the way that they want it. So, you know, Apple kind of has that over them. Awesome. Cool. So, so 
So the antitrust was who was who was uh, who was complaining about their app not getting out Spotify there? Spotify was. Okay. Yeah, Spotify sent the commission to send the antitrust complaint because it wasn't like because like one article I saw I said they sued them and then the one that I read it was just like a complaint, but it was something of let me look for unfair policies regarding their app store. That okay. What the Got it. Said. All right. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, no cool. Yay! Let's give a hand for Julian. So, uh, you know, we don't have a million presentations, so we can discuss them as they come by. So that's, that's uh, interesting news. Do you guys have any thoughts about what Julian was reporting on there? Yeah, I'm surprised Apple's passed Spotify in the U.S. Uh-huh. That's what shocked me. I didn't think they would. They have yeah, more, yeah. Because they're not on my radar. Apple Music is not on my radar. I'm well, do you have an iPhone? I know. Like, that's why. Yeah. I'm surprised Apple didn't. I mean, they should have done this a long time ago, and they should have had, you know, Spotify never should have been a, an issue. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. mean, they, I shouldn't, mean they, they shouldn't have allowed a big well, competitor to grow up like that? Well, like, I think just Apple just dropped the ball. Like, they had iTunes yeah. and the whole streaming music thing. They were just late to the game um, yeah. in developing that. They should have been first to the game. They had everything in place. They should have. Yeah. I mean, Spotify just never should have been a contender. That's a good point. Maybe they were making too much money off of downloads and stuff, and they figured, why should yeah, we, why should we cannibalize that by creating a streaming service? Yeah. Maybe I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. For just such a forward-thinking company, it's like that's something that they just didn't envision. Yeah, it's possible. <coughs> Julie, what, Kira, podcasts? what? Doesn't Apple Music? They, they have podcasts out there. That's probably what's. Well, they, I mean, there's a podcast app on your yeah. iPhone. There are, yeah. There's like, like radio shows. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and there's like Blonde. Yeah. And Spotify doesn't have that kind of no. quote. Of, okay. It's like, yeah. Well, Spotify has it's like, like Apple <coughs> music yeah. exclusives. Yeah, Pandora still. Has their own like podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, their own exclusives. Sometimes they come out like a week early. Right. Than like everywhere else. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, That's a good true. strategy. Huh. It's hard to put those on Apple Music. Anyone can put their podcast on Spotify, but on Apple Music, it's not like. No, you can do it for really? Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, it's, oh, well, like, it's, 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 yeah, on, it's easy on iTunes, but you can't, like, make your own radio show, I don't think, on Apple Music, can you? No, you can. You just do, oh. like, an RSS feed, and then you go oh. sit on there with, like, Apple yeah. I don't use it. But so for any of these know. things, you have to pay a, you have to pay a fee to buy into Spotify yeah. and post your stuff. Yeah. You also have to do that with Apple Music and all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did Spotify just spend $100 million for some kind of podcasting network? No, I mean, Hundred million? That sounds like a lot, but maybe that would be something to check out. Um, so another thing that Julian was saying, which uh, is reminiscent of the browser wars, where um, uh, you know Microsoft was giving away Windows Explorer in Europe, and they were dinged for that. Like basically, the you know you you were mentioning that uh, Spotify is complaining that uh, you know. It sounded like it anyway. That Spotify is complaining that the uh, Apple, the Apple Store, whatever the App Store, doesn't treat all uh, streaming services equal. Like there's limiting their visibility. Basically, yeah. Or you know, I mean, there's such a strong potential for Apple's service to uh, dominate because it's in I, you know, it's in the whole you know, format and everything that's going to be included on your iPhone and stuff like that versus, so this is reminiscent of Windows Explorer, which wound up wiping out Netscape uh, with the early browsers, right? And, uh, and so in Europe, uh, Microsoft was actually forced to stop bundle, bundling Windows Explorer along with the operating system. But here in the U.S., they allowed it. And of course, you know, if you bought a new PC and it came right away with uh, Windows Explorer, you know, the, the browser app, um, then it was going to be like, oh, of course, you know, we'll, we'll use that and who needs Netscape anymore? And so, but in Europe, they viewed that as kind of an unfair competitive edge because everybody with a PC had, you know, Windows. And so. Yeah, so Spotify, I'm sorry, I'm going back. Spotify yeah, go paid 100 million for Parcast. And then yesterday, Luminary came out with $100 million for their podcast network. So Luminary, some other startup. It's another network. It's not podcast, or not a big thing where everyone's throwing their money at. Hey, Fenris. And yeah. so somebody bought that as well, yeah? No, Luminary's on by their own. Okay. 
Hardcast is what uh, Spotify bought. Oh, okay. Hardcast for 100 million, and they're like a podcasting network. Okay. Yeah, kind of like a radio network. A lot of money. Yeah, I don't know if that was million, smart. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Uh, okay, well, Fenris just walked in, so we're basically moving. So how about CJ now? Hey, sooner or later, CJ's up. Ew. Sorry, just like Here's the mic. You can read it for sure. Yeah, right. that, that's sometimes is the most effective. Okay, so the Wall Street Journal reports on January 28, 2019, that Bill Simmons Bringer Podcast Network exceeded over $15 million in ad sales during 2019. Many know Bill Simmons for his work during his 14-year stretch at ESPN as being one of the company's most provocative commentators. Three years ago, after an abrupt departure from the company, he placed a big bet on himself and launched The Ringer. The network hosts 28 podcasts, which range from pop culture, sports, politics, and food, that generate about 35 million downloads per month. The Ringer's website features in-depth reporting and quick analysis from the podcast writers as well as other employees from The Ringer staff, which floats around 100 employees. Companies such as ZipRecruiter is, or companies such as ZipRecruiter, Captain Morgan, and Callaway Golf pay twenty-five dollars to twenty or twenty-five to fifty dollars per thousand uh, listeners per ad. The Ringer keeps about two-thirds of the re or two-thirds of the revenue, and the rest go to Midroll, the audio advertising agency who handles much of their ad space. Simmons has also negotiated a multi-million-dollar deal with HBO, which gives HBO, which gives HBO first look rights to all of his media content. He remains focused on his current business plan and doesn't intend to raise outside capital because he believes that if you raise money, you have all these people in your life that you have to deal with that have certain expectations that you might not have, or that might not have the same vision, that might not have the same vision you have. I assume that's a quote at the end, right? Yes. And, and can you just remind us, you said it was $15 million in ad revenue yeah, for, for, for the year? Yeah, from, from 2018. 2018, okay, yeah. awesome. Cool. Thanks, CJ. Yay. Yeah, come on, some applause, folks. You did a good job. Yay. So that one definitely sounded like a news report. Um, well, that's pretty interesting following on uh, the data point that someone paid $100 million for a podcasting network. And now we hear that The Ringer, which is one I've heard of, is making $15 million a year. Yeah. And I, like I didn't really mention it, but like the deal with HBO, it's like two million dollars a year, where like all his ideas just get funneled to HBO. Hmm. Do you know any that have like turned into an HBO series yet, or something? Um, I know he did like Andre the Giant. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if that was ESPN or something, or e ESPN or HBO. But okay. He had like his own like deal with each with HBO for his own TV show. Which like died. Okay. Yeah, they canceled. Did they actually produce it and it didn't go? Yeah, they like it was like a four year, eleven million dollars. <laughs> so they just like canceled it and gave him like a two two million dollar deal like each year for like his ideas. Huh. That's interesting. I mean Vice did great by, you know, teaming up with HBO. Yeah. And that was a similar, you know, sort of like upstart digital property that found a uh, content partner in HBO. Uh, and they do great stuff. Um, I noticed a couple of things. Come on in. I noticed uh, uh, CJ said that uh, uh, advertisers on um, on the Ringer pay between twenty-five and fifty dollars per thousand listeners. What is that measurement? We talked about it in class. CPM. CPM. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So that gives you an idea of. Uh, Podcast CPM, which is pretty, at $50, it's pretty good. It's competitive with uh, television advertising, which is among the most expensive. So that, that was interesting to hear that data point come up there and stuff. And uh, yeah, cool. Um, we're employees. Uh, nice. All right. Uh, Kira, you want to come up next? Okay, I feel like mine is not as good as everyone else's. Do it well, we've only heard two, and so it's good to come up early. You're going to set the bar, I'm sure. Uh, I'll, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Netflix will now be able, or no, eligible for Academy Awards if they follow the necessary requirements. 
Despite Steven Spielberg's disgust at the thought of a Netflix film winning an Academy Award, Martin Scorsese will be in luck for his new film, The Irishman, which could possibly be considered for an Academy Award if it, if it has a minimum seven-day theatrical run in Los Angeles County theaters with a minimum of three screenings during those seven days for a paid admission, which are the requirements. The Irishman is already dominating the promotional drum as the Tribeca Film Festival starts next week. This is a huge step in a positive direction for not only Netflix, but Martin Scorsese as well. The question is though, which streaming service will be next up for a possible Oscar nomination? All right. Thank you. I'm just gonna let Mike. I keep hearing about it, yeah. I can. All right, good job, good job. <laughs> he's here. Yeah, he's trying to yes. Yes. Right. I think, I don't know if the in it, but he's like a co-producer. Awesome. So, Kira, did I understand that uh, it's basically is the, to, to get an Oscar at all, your film has to screen for at least a week in an L.A. area yeah, theater? specifically Los Angeles. Okay, yeah. so, and, the, and they're not going to freeze out any Netflix production as long as it meets those requirements. Yeah, if, if it meets everything, then it's, it's eligible. That's cool. Yeah. And it has to be, uh, what's the deal? It has to be like, 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 that seven day, like the opening day has to be like one week prior to like whenever they close consideration for okay. the Oscars. So they have you to have like all in. that time within the year to like release it. It okay. has to be there. Yeah, I've always noticed there's a lot of releases just before, you know, Christmas yeah. or something. Like I guess that must be when they stop consideration. Right. Interesting. Okay, so they're not going to discriminate against Netflix, it looks like. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I, mean, I think a lot of people trying to make movies agree with that yay that, um, you know, it's like... Yeah, cause Netflix is putting out movies that aren't just franchise behemoths, you know? Right, right. actually Famous investing directors. in quality movies, you know? It's not Famous all. directors are making movies on Netflix. Right. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of the best ever. Oh. Okay, who's up next? Can we... Uh, um, we're giving everyone who came a little late a chance to just get acclimated. So uh, is it Jason coming on next? OK. All right, I'm looking at the back row saying, you guys be ready too. But Jason, go ahead. Uh, do we have any gamers in the house? So I wrote about, uh, there's been like a lot of reports uh, coming out about like the PlayStation 5, um, like when it'll come out. Um, should be coming out within the next two years. Um, I just wrote, uh, multiple news outlets reported that within the next two years, entertainment giant Sony plans on releasing the long-awaited yet unnamed PlayStation 5. That's what we're calling it right now. <laughs> um, according to game developer Mark Kearney, uh, he's responsible for making noted titles like Jack and Daxter, Uncharted, Sonic, Crash Bandicoot. Um, states that the next-gen console will have previously unattainable graphical fidelity and visual effects, and we'll have bigger storage space to accommodate for these massive game files. Um, the console will also feature a more powerful SSD, which stands for Solid State Drive, so these games can also load faster because it's not fun getting a new game and then you know waiting like an hour or so to, for it to download. <laughs> You're eager to play it. Um, the PS5 will also support ray tracing, a technique that models the travel of light um, to stimulate complex interactions in 3D environments, already, already widely uh, used in Hollywood. Um, and I thought to also like talk about uh, its main competitor, uh, Microsoft. It's also, they announced, I believe, last year that they're going to be that they're in development and are going to be releasing the next-gen Xbox, which is, I guess, is going to be called Xbox Scarlet. Um, so I just thought to include that because there's lots of competition in the gaming industry. And uh, those are the two biggest ones we have, pretty much. So 
thought to include that. So yeah. Mm, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Applause. Uh, so, am I am I right? And uh, this is you know building on top of what you were talking about. But am I right in thinking that like three D is going to become like a really big thing next? Yeah. Like, in terms of more immersive gaming and stuff. Yeah, it just poses the question like how much further is it going to get? Like with outside technology like constantly like getting better and better, how it's going to dive into like the gaming industry and like. What are are people talking about like immersive? Mm -hmm. You know, using Oculus or whatever in order to make the game more VR-ish? Yeah, they already like? have, like, uh, PlayStation VR, but I can only imagine it's going to be more in-depth and more realistic than it already is now. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Cool. And um, let's say, like, Microsoft comes out with something amazing next year and PlayStation is behind. Is this kind of like... A, like the, uh, you know, um, Intel versus AMD type of thing where they're always trying to beat each other. One-up each of, other. Yeah, is that, is that sort of the dynamic in the gaming industry as well? Yeah. Yeah, Microsoft and Sony just like for years and years have just like been at constant competition. Like, and it seems like it's now even just like a preference. Like, what do you like better? Like, because they both pretty much have like very, very similar like features. But Do they have the same game titles on them, or are there some Some of them have like exclusives. Um, right. Is, Microsoft and is, is getting a hold of some really amazing game in term, and having an exclusive right to it, is that something that can push That's people you. to buy your platform? Yeah. Like a lot of people, like uh, Uncharted, I know, um, Mr. Kearney, responsible for taking part in the development of that game. That's a Sony exclusive. And they have like three or four titles for the Uncharted series. Mm. And that's, I know, is like one of the bigger games that Sony has mm. exclusively. Sounds like a <coughs> perilous business. Yeah. Being so competitive, having relying like on hardware manufacturers to beat the other guys, getting great titles in the software area. Sounds... Uh, Sounds nerve-wracking, yeah. honestly. <laughs> OK, cool. Mike, do you want to come up, or you want to wait a little while? Oh, wait one more. You wait one more. OK, Rick, you're up next, then. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's because oh, okay. people who had a chance to settle in, people who had a chance to settle in. Go for it. Get to go. This is better be good. Excuse me. <laughs> Professor. Yes. Are we just audio or video we take? It's video. There's a camera back there watching. Okay, got it. <laughs> That's why I dressed up today. I'm put a makeup. That's right. Um, a pink shirt. <laughs> so as we all know, more and more people are cord cutting and uh, moving to streaming or what we call over the top uh, services. We currently have big guns like Amazon, Netflix, who and now Apple is jumping into the original programming um, scenario to try and win the eyes, hearts, and pocketbooks of as many people as possible. On March 25th, Apple announced its very own streaming service called Apple TV Plus. Very original. <laughs> uh, the purpose of this move, at least for Apple, is to try and keep as many people as possible in their ecosystem without relying on their rival's content. Uh, taking a page out of Netflix playbook, uh, they'll try to bundle as many devices as possible uh, with, with their app. For example, you'll be able to stream Apple's content on Roku and Amazon devices. Apple TV Plus uh, currently have projects with Oprah Winfrey, Steven Spielberg, and Jennifer Aniston, among others, in the works. And they also plan on spending $2 million this year on uh, original programming content. Um, that's it. As a result, Netflix is also pledging another $2 billion on top of the $10 million they spent this year. Whoa. So it's all heating up. Um, that's it. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Yeah, I did notice Netflix borrowed an additional $2 billion. Yeah, they, uh, in response to, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I find the whole business nerve-wracking. Awesome. That's great, Rick. And that that kind of leads into our new uh, our new streaming topic possibilities too. So we'll come back to that talk. Mike, you ready? I'm ready but, uh, this is the, you have to be over here for the camera. Okay. Uh, 
shooting and maybe just right here would probably be yeah. good. Oh, okay. Self set. Right. I think she probably wants you a little off the screen. If you could just come a bit further here. Yeah. That looks great. So, do you want me to hold the mic so you can hold the paper? Yeah, Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. To the minutes, uh, oh, okay. Well, we can we can accommodate okay. some, yeah. I'm just standing here with a mic. Go when you're ready, of course. Okay, morning, and uh, I'm glad to wait to speak for me and give into some detail, uh, some, some sim, uh, similar information. But uh, this is a report from 10 a.m. news on the BCST news group. Let's go to industrial news. Go directly to Google and Amazon. Uh, in order to better serve their streaming user, they come to agreement. Uh, they have made the announcement together on April 18 not too long ago that they agree to bring their streaming video apps to each other's platform. That we may mention some of it earlier before me. Uh, in the months ahead, before the end of the year, hopefully Thanksgiving, and uh, officially YouTube app will come to Amazon Fire TV device, having the stick and the, the Fire TV uh, hardware, while uh, they will allow Amazon Prime video apps available on Comcast and other Comcast video services. I think the advantage for them to try this out is to they can leverage each other's platform, maximize the user experience and test the market. So the main theme of this news report is about what is the best alternative to the expen to the expensive cable service? <coughs> what about video streaming? First started streaming service as an add-on to DVD and digital download offering for second one, movie, TV shows, etc. When more and more higher speed internet connections available and more supply of video streaming service also available for the market. So cable service is going to be, as we know, in history, maybe obsolete. And uh, let's get a couple of big companies like AT&T, they already bought Warner Media and all its subsidized, sub, sub, subsidiaries like CNN, HBO, CW, DC Comics, etc. Disney also owns 21st Century Fox. They are in process to launch Disney Plus as their own video streaming service. They are all going after the service. Viacom recently bought Punto, P-L-U-T-O. Is a free TV service supported by it. So, what are you going to do? You have pain of choice, so you can cut off the cable services. Remember, don't pay more for your streaming service than cable. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. There we go. Thank you. That's what you do. <laughs> That's excellent. That is, uh, that's really good background for the term paper topic that I money. concocted as well. Yeah, well, that is, that is real interesting. So from my understanding there, from, from the, uh, uh, the relatively, you know, uh, small news that Amazon and Google are allowing each other's apps on their associated I'm platforms. You know, two big giants, they will allow, I guess, no friends forever, mm -hmm. no enemy forever. Six, six, <coughs> I was surprised Apple, like when I was doing mine, oh, Apple was, Apple. Apple's a closed garden and now they're like, oh, we're going to be on Roku and we're going to be on all these other devices. Like, yeah. So yeah. Netflix is everywhere. They want to be everywhere. Yeah, too, I, guess. Have choice. Yeah. I yeah. think so, you know, and it's a shift in their business, right? They created the closed garden because they controlled all the technology, but now if they want to compete as a production studio, yeah. Yeah. then it's not in their interest to restrict it just to their devices unless... Unless they've got some massive, massive star, you know, I mean, the way that some pop artists will release only on their own little, you know, label and, you know, um, they might do that. But generally, they have to play with everybody else, I think. That's true. 
And then uh, the other thing is you mentioned this. Uh, uh, yeah, that's an apple. Oh, it's OK. No, no worries. But Viacom and Pluto. So my understanding of that is Pluto is an OTT service uh, that might appear on Roku or whatever. Uh, so And Viacom is a quickly collapsing sort of cable, cable network provider, right? So CBS and Viacom are together. Oh, and uh, CBS for ages has kind of propped up Viacom, which owns BET. It owns uh, MTV. I mean, it's got big brands, but not everybody is even going to those big brands for what they used to offer. So, so yeah. Pluto available on the cell phone? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it's definitely OTT, which means that it comes into your TV along with thousands of other channels that you probably don't care about. <laughs> and so it's, it's, a diff it's kind of a different part of the business, but it's but very interesting it's to hear them. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, once you've got your Roku or whatever OTT oh. is, which is more like a channel changer than any kind of thing that will unlock exclusive content that you really care about. So anyway, it's, it's just, it's, it's interesting to hear those things. Uh, uh, you know, wanna, in the same on the same page, basically. I want to make a quick statement, if yeah. I may. It's interesting. I have the second hand, hand news that Apple bought a ten or hundred acres of land to mm -hmm. to be in production. I think it's something about our our automobile. The VNC we have, they're going to put an online platform or on-screen platform, so we can see. I don't know. I'll provide content. Mm -hmm. Watch CNN. And then in front of you, you can see all the traffic because you don't want to drive in them. I mean, you don't want to put your hand on the steering wheel. Got it. I don't know how safe it is, but I know. Oh, it's not safe. So that's that's a second that's a second <laughs> use item, but but uh, it sounds it sounds I'm like first one on it. <laughs> is it are they buying like a production studio for some of their in-house production, or you are linking it to in smart cars? Is that yes? To my understanding, technology-wise, it's it's app software, but it feels a bit enhancement to our hardware on the automobile, the mm. windshield. Mm. Got it. So that's bigger than cell phone. Right. Oh. We'll see, right? But once right. cars once cars can drive themselves, then you can turn them into televisions inside. Meditate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Chris, can we have a sure. do your thing? Awesome. Uh, a lot of these. Frick yeah. <laughs> has to, I guess. Hey. My presentation is about uh, sorry. My presentation is about the current uh, negotiations between the Writers Guild of America and four big talent agencies who are represented by the uh, what are they? The uh, Association of Talent Agents. Yeah. Negotiations have broken down between the Writers Guild of America and the four major talent agencies, WME, CAA, UTA, and ICM Partners. According to a recent article in Variety, the WGA has filed suit against the agencies, claiming that their proposal for a compromise failed to address the concerns of the writers they represent. Since the 1970s, agencies have represented writers for a 10% commission on procuring writing jobs for their clients. In recent years, it has become standard practice, however, for the agencies to sell talent packages, which consists of writers, actors, and directors that they are representing, to studios for a much larger fee in addition to the standard 10% commission. The WGA claims the agencies are placing company profits over the well-being of their own clients, leading to salary stagnation for writers. In response to the agency's proposal of contributing 1% of packaging fees to the WGA, guild, uh, Sorry. Guild leaders have announced that over 92% of their members have sent formalized termination letters to their agents and suggested, man suggested that managers broker work for their writers. The Association of Talent Agents filed a countersuit claiming that under Los Angeles County law, brokers must be licensed with the county in order to procure jobs for their writers. The breakdown in relations comes amidst a heavy television season and decreasing theater attendance, leaving the writers, agents, and an entire industry uh, with an uncertain path in future negotiations. The current contract agreement between the WGA and ATA expires next week, after which uh, the WGA has asked all talent agencies to sign 
a code of conduct rather than a new uh, agreement. Um, interestingly enough, while the four major agencies have refused to do that, uh, a lot of the smaller agencies are seeing this as an opportunity, and they've all signed the code of conduct conduct agreement. Yeah. Wow! So it's not it's very, very informative. Anyone, any ideas about that? I don't think it's going to lead to a writer's strike, but it's definitely going to change the way contracts are negotiated. I mean, it could totally upend the whole agent business. Like right. Agency. Yeah. Like, like the first issue is kind of like if, if they're all canceling their contracts with their agencies, but nobody in Los Angeles County is allowed to procure work for them except for a bro an agent, basically. Yeah. Well, so I would say that all of those small agencies or stand to gain big time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, like 95% of the um, guild members agree with like the guild leadership and their approach to this. Yeah. Aside from they don't want the guild negotiating a percentage of the package fees. Okay, so 1% yeah. is a bit of an insult and they're not gonna be happy with more. Either. Yeah, they don't want them, they want, all the members want the package. Eliminated. Eliminated, yeah, they don't want that to be a thing anymore. They get what they want. It's yeah. pretty interesting, the whole development there. Uh, the lawyer's happy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the other thing. They're trying to get lawyers and managers to negotiate jobs for the writers, which is illegal. Right. So right. there's all sorts of so that, yeah. going on right now. Right. That's the issue, especially if you want work, right? And yeah. then you, you don't know who you can go to anymore unless you go in with a small agency, which, is, like I say, I think they stand to gain from it. Yeah. But maybe, you know, Maybe they'll fix the rule. Interesting. OK, cool. Thanks, Chris. That goes to the heart of uh, streaming and dramatic production stuff nowadays. So that's great. All right, uh, we're going back to the back row. Would you like to come up and do your thing? Thank you. And then Fenris, you're on, you're on deck. Try to be on the mark. So he's there you go. Hit your mark. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the business scale between uh, the Walt Mike. Disney, oh, Walt Disney Company, and Fox News. Um, so on March 20th, 2019, the New York Times reported that Rupert Machaz, former company, the Fox, uh, the 20th Century Fox Movie and Television Studio, is now owned by the Walt Disney Company itself. Disney have put up the offer to $71.3 billion. The Justice Department agreed to this deal as long as Disney, which owns ESPN, had to sell off 22 regional sports networks that were originally part of the purchase. Fox includes popular media series and movies including The Simpsons, as well as X-Men and Avatar franchise. Fox Corporation is now a standalone company that will retain ownership of its broadcast network, the Fox News Channel, Fox Business, Fox Business Network, and Fox Sports. The negative outcome of the deal would cause thousands of people to likely lose their jobs due to the, due to the combining. No doubt a lot will change from this historic event in the media industry. Cool. Thank you. That's like the biggest, the biggest news out there. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, though. Yeah, it is. It is. Disney owns like so much now. Everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but notice, notice, they only required them to uh, to sell off the uh, uh, sports, the sports, right? Because of the dominance of ESPN, they felt that okay, the only real competitor is the Fox, and uh, you know, sports subnets. So they made them sell. You gonna do it? Yeah, come on. Should we? Should, can I give you a, a microphone at least? No, I'm not no? voice. So. Okay, come on, go for it, Fenrir. Okay, at 12:02 a.m. on Wednesday, March 20th, Disney took over Fox and reported 7.713 7 billion, uh, and both Disney's and Fox's stock rose about 10 points. Huh. Um. Disney only had great things to say about the merger, but most Fox employees are actually scared about it. 
because not only that they will be laid off, they're also cutting about 20% of current TV programming on the air that were, are on Fox now. The only thing that's really Disney's getting out of it is stock share for Hulu, which brings them up to about 60%, and the entire Fox library of about 200 films. It's good and bad. I mean, they get the remainder of the Marvel characters, such as X-Men, Fantastic Four, um, So that's pretty cool that they get all of the Marvel characters that they ever wanted. Oh yes, uh, it now pushes uh, Disney's library to a total of 600 films, 510 TV shows. Um, but yeah, I personally don't care for the merger. I think it's actually quite stupid. I mean, it's good, but it's only going to create drama later on in Fox's and Disney's library whatever for the streaming services. Mm. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Fenris. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the move makes sense for, uh, for Rupert Murdoch and, uh, you know, Fox in a sense. I mean, either, I think they had to combine with somebody and it's, you know, either they would have tried to grow into a competitor to Disney uh, by, you know, picking up some other libraries, or maybe it just made more sense to get out now and sell it and, you know, make a, make a giant thing out of Disney rather than to try to compete with it, you know, so. I mean, the only thing that they could really merge with is ABC. Well, Disney owns that, exactly. right? Yeah, so, so you know, yeah, they'd, they'd be looking around for some kind of library that they could add in, so. Not an easy call, I guess. So they decided to stay in the propaganda business. And, yeah. uh, uh, I was reading an interesting article on that. Like, they had to sell, basically, like their propaganda news network really isn't as influential as people think it is. Hmm. And But it's their cash cow. It's the only thing that's yeah. really making them that's any right. money at all. So they decided to just double down on that. And they had to get rid of everything Stick else to that. losing money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there's a whole kind of family succession melodrama back there as to which of the kids was going to take the company and stuff. And yeah. It turns out neither of the boys was a good fit and the daughter didn't want it at all. So, so this is a merger. So I think you call Sam? No, no, they're not. It was sold to Disney. Acquisition. Yeah, oh, yeah wow. it was acquisition. So. So, you know, this yeah. Everything. <laughs> yeah. The siblings hate each other, so. I, <laughs> apparently, they, <laughs> of course, like what else? <laughs> if you're billionaires by inheritance, what else have you got to do except hate on the rest of your siblings? Okay, uh, would you like to come up to yours? Yeah. And Kibwe, we, we haven't forgotten you. We're going to round out the pack. Uh, Saving the best for last. Company mm -hmm. made. Company man, I mean, it could make a great Fox, you know, hour-long soap opera. Right, the Murdoch family, yeah. Uh, fine. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to do a review of Disney Plus. Um, I'm going to talk about Interscope, uh, this company, and developments with them. Um, so, yesterday, April 24th, 2019, Variety Magazine reported that Interscope Films will be premiering three films at this year's Tribeca Film Festival in New York City. Um, Interscope Films is taking this opportunity to relaunch itself into the film industry, having been formerly known as Interscope Pictures. Um, the film company is serious about filmmaking and wants to show that they are more than just an extension of their music company, Interscope Records, by creating films that will stand on their own. The three films that will be unveiled this weekend are Sublime, a documentary about the band and their late lead singer Bradley Noel, A Day in the Life of America, a documentary directed by actor and musician Jared Leto, and third, a musical film called The Wrong Man. Of course, this is just the first wave of projects set to be coming our way. We will know more as soon as the newly launched Interscope Films is ready to announce details to further upcoming projects. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, so originally Interscope started out as Interscope Communications in 82, and they then 
were also known as Interscope Pictures, and then in 1990, they kind of weaned off their uh, film production to become the music company, Interscope Records. Um, and I think one of the last films that they produced was The Pianist with Roman Polanski. Wow. So because of all the shit going on with that, I think that they kind of pulled out from producing films, but doing more uh, soundtracks for films instead. Because um, they were like on La La Land and a bunch of other wow. films that, uh, the one with Lady Gaga, they were, Stars. they, Stars. they Stars. yeah, so they, um, they pretty much own all the soundtrack stuff for that. Interesting. Um, and, and, and who's behind it? Like, it sounded like it was a record company as well. Like, are there, yeah, so are there stars Steve involved? Yeah, so it's and Janet. So they're both getting involved in, in relaunching as Interscope films, and they want to focus more on film um, and not just music. And wow. because, like, before they've done a lot of films, that music was kind of like the main character of it, and the soundtrack was the main character, but they want to kind of break off as just being known as a music industry. Do the whole film yeah. production. Yeah, and they really are trying to, like, make their name as just a film production company. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have released Teen Spirit a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, and that one was, like, that was a, a big thing for them because they wanted to break off. I was trying to see. I want to see it. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, Theatrical release? Like it's supposed yeah. to be in movie theaters? Yeah, yeah so yeah. Um, that one, it's starring Elle Fanning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the director and writer is Max Minghella. And he's... Uh, it rings a bell, but I don't he's know. He's in The Handmaid's Tale and other films, oh. too. But his dad is also a film producer. Okay. Um, so he has, like, and his brother's, like, a music video producer. So he has a lot of ties in the industry. Um, okay. But Interscope is making some strides to try to be more than just music. I'll say it's, that's like four films in a row you just mentioned there. Yes, yeah. and they have more coming out too. Like the one, The Wrong Man, is actually also supposed to be um, set to do like a, a Broadway musical show as well. Okay. Um, like coming later this year or next year, but they have a lot of stuff cooking in their pot and cool. it's very interesting. It sounded important, but how do they get on your radar? Just like um, you know, just I, looking around and you said this is interesting? I've or? actually been following that director, Max Minghella. Okay. Just because I saw his work in The Handmaid's Tale and I okay. became curious about him. So he's a director of part, some of the episodes? Uh, he's, he's or he an actor. He yeah. plays Nick, who's like the, he's one of the eyes or whatever. Okay. Um, but he's uh, he has like a interesting um, history and like sure. like work case. So. so that's how you got onto the story. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, cool. Well, thank and you. I follow a lot of film festivals, so yeah. it was interesting. Uh, yesterday was the first day yeah. of the Tribeca Film Festival, oh. so it's running until May fifth, and so it was a lot of news coming out yeah. last night. So that's why my article wasn't. From earlier. Right. No, it's yesterday. like yesterday. Yeah. Fresh Very news. Busy. Couldn't have fresher news than that. Right. Yeah. Professor, just, huh? so Stephen and I asked we can post our news festival for the last month. On Canvas? On Canvas, yeah. Yeah. So us. Okay, so yeah, I was just gonna at the end of it all, remember you don't get the credit just for coming up and saying your piece, but uh, CJ, I'm picking on CJ because he comes up first here, but this is perfect, right? Just uh, uh, enter in your script and, and the link to the original story, and then you're done. You get your points doing that, okay? And you have a week to, to get it in because just a lot of people are just focused on the uh, presentation, which is uh, totally understandable. Kibway, do you want to come up and do yours? We've been making you wait forever. I thought it was going to be like after. <laughs> it's like it's because you're hidden behind my monitor here. It's like, oh, damn. I don't mean to forget you, but I did. So, um, I think my presentation on the report was on Disney Plus. So it's supposed to start in November, and it starts at seven dollars a month, or seventy dollars a year if you get an annual subscription. I think they're having a um, package deal for Hulu members and I think ESPN Plus members as well. 
that um, they said that it will be they'll have exclusive shows including new Marvel and Star Wars Avengers and they're going to also have every single episode of The Simpsons on the streaming service as well. And Disney predicts it would reach over 60 million to 90 million subscribers by the end of the 2024 fiscal year. And Netflix is already or Netflix is already swollen to nearly 140 million. And Disney predicts that its content spending would jump from 1 billion in its first year to 2 billion four years later. Next, Netflix, by comparison, will spend an estimated 12 billion on content this year. And Disney Plus will have more than 7,500 television episodes and 500 films on its catalog as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank you. Share my money. It's just interesting to hear, like, <laughs> right away, The Simpsons, you know, is all of The Simpsons is going to be up there. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's the benefit of buying yeah. buying Fox, right? You can say, we got all of that now. Make a lot of money. It's interesting. Like, every chance they get. They talk about Disney all the time. And yeah. Fox. And now Disney owns them. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so it's, it's like the cam up Disney yeah. and uh, Com um, and Cuckoo and Namso. I don't know who's going to own the, all the entertainment. It could well be Amazon. I'm not sure. Everybody had a chance to do their presentation, right? That is, that is good. It's very good. So don't forget to get your script in at the prompt. Or if you have to, leave it, leave it with me if you want as well. Did you want to get your name on the attendance sheet as well? OK. So, guys, can we dig into uh, research? Because we're getting towards the end of the class, believe it or not. Getting into modules, I just want to bring your attention. I mean, so many people have been talking about streaming. Uh, it makes me feel good that we kind of anticipated and said, so research paper two due on May 9th. Um, you know, you like the first research paper, you pick a topic, and uh, it's basically a four-page uh, paper in which you, you know, respond to the topic. Uh, the textbook is your best reference, but I know that a lot of this, for instance, I wouldn't even know where to look for uh, material in the textbook to go answering this new prompt that I just concocted. So you may want to um, uh, go looking on the internet for the kind of information that you were presenting to us today. So I mean, so some of you guys could already have half of this written based on what you were talking about today, or a big part of it. So uh, references can come from the internet as well. Chris, did you have Quick a question? question. Yeah. It says, don't forget to include your selected topic at the start of your paper. Yeah. Um, do you mean just like in the opening paragraph? Like uh, some people put it like right after the, the title of the paper title. even. Yeah. So okay. as, as long as it's clear like which way, you can copy paste you know, the whole thing <laughs> even if you want. I mean, uh, but as long as I know which one you're actually writing about, which is because sometimes they're not all that different one from the other, or, you know. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, let me just read through with you this new one that, I'm, that I kind of created to address uh, video streaming. So it says, only a few years ago, streaming video was touted as the savior technology that would free audiences from the bloated bundles and spiraling fees imposed by cable TV providers. So cord cutters, which is, as you know from the class, what we call people who you know, cancel their cable subscription because they figure they can do better with streaming. So cord cutters were going to be able to watch anything, anytime for way less money. So now, how is the audience's understanding of the streaming video environment changing as the number of existing or planned streaming services grows? So, you know, from the initial idea that, hey, we're just going to get lots of cheap shows and we won't have to subscribe to cable anymore, how is that getting a little more realistic now that we're looking at these things? How are consumers likely to deal with multiple streaming bills? Which of the streaming services is likely to prosper and why? So consider its business model, its track record in the entertainment business, or its access to a massive existing user base. What provider do you think will ultimately win the streaming wars? Netflix, Disney, YouTube, Apple, Hulu, 
AT&T, Warner Media. I left off Amazon, so we should really put that in there. As you guys were talking today, I thought, oh yeah, maybe Amazon is going to do it. So is there, is there uh, what, do you, what do you think about the prompt? Is there enough there to work with? Yes. Yeah, I think so. So those of you who were already talking about um, you know, streaming, uh, some of you were talking directly about the streaming business, and some people were talking, like for instance, the, the Fox acquisition could you know, very, very much be one part of a discussion of how you know, maybe Disney is trying to orient itself to be a big competitor to Netflix. You just need enough content. Do you guys have any thoughts about this you want to share now? Because it's all, it's good to get ideas out there in advance. And like well, if you were writing this, Mike? Uh, I, think it, I have two pages, so. Yeah. One part is talking about the current landscape of the media uh, market. It's going to be uh, foreseeing more, uh, what do you call um, Do you want me to give you the paper? Sorry. Uh, more cons consolidation and creation. So, uh, in my paper, I say I, I, I said this. In my opinion is about who is owning most media properties and saving the best content. Yes. I would say such as choices for the user. Mm -hmm. So, who has the best control, of most access to the library? Yeah. Which is the, the database or whether it's TV, or movie, or musical, yeah. etc. Yeah. And, uh, and be able to pro also provide uh, the best original content, which is, seems like you mentioned earlier, uh, everyone seems like want to have a piece of the production. Yeah, so the yeah. control of the final product, the way they want it, appeal to the customer or the target market they are pushing. So, so you already said a lot. Let me just pause there for a sec and see if, if anybody else wants to join in on either of those. I see at least two super points of interest or focus that you could do here. So number one is, you know, the driving consolidation is not only, you know, the business sense of creating a giant corporation that will have a high value stock. And I think, was it Fenris who said that the stock for both Fox and uh, uh, Disney went up by 10% <laughs> on, the, on the news of that. So that's a big deal. But as Mike is saying, uh, you know, in terms of the streaming wars, having control of the library that everybody wants the shows that are in the library is going to be a big deal. And so that's a real interesting point. Consolidation being driven by the need to just get enough content to you know, sustain people's interests, to make sure that they're going to subscribe to your streaming service. That's a big deal. And, and then I think the other point you were making is this issue of, you know, being, becoming a studio, uh, producing original content because you, you know, need that as an edge over what everybody else has. You know, in a sense, if, if I'm thinking about it, I don't know what, what you guys think, but if you're, if you're looking over the library of a service and you're thinking, should I spend my seven bucks with Disney or should I spend 12 bucks with Netflix? And you're looking it over and you see, well, one of my options has, you know, 15 years of sitcoms that I could care less about. My other option has stuff that I can only find on this service. Maybe I'll go with Netflix because it's got, you know, Black Mirror or something, which I think is a genius show. And I really want to be able to see those when they come out, you know. So, so, so it's, there's a lot of kind of programming issues coming up around. So both are good points, Mike. Very good. Yeah, I think you did right. How much are we willing to spend? Yeah, so that's another thing. Is, is anybody interested in the whole issue of like, how can you get people to spend on several of these? I mean, that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, it's a lot of services to pay for. You end up spending what you would have with cable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so hang on, anybody else out there? <laughs> We're just thinking about how this looks to the consumer. The idea that, yeah? I mean, having so many streaming services, I already, 
like with my Spotify account, they give me Showtime and Hulu. Uh -huh. But then Hulu's like, we're gonna add stars and HBO and all these other um, like content providers, right? Mm -hmm. I don't even have time alone <laughs> to watch Agreed. all of that stuff. Like, yeah, right. like I already have a Netflix account, and then they, you know, then I have Hulu. Like it gives me other ways to like watch certain shows, but it's like there's already so much stuff yeah. on one provider that like I'm gonna get so overwhelmed. Like it's like they want us to just sit at home all day and watch TV. <laughs> right, like, right. <laughs> And have your phone constantly on while yeah. streaming something. Yeah. And then that, that whole like streaming from your phone now, so it's like they just want us to be glued to a TV screen 24-7. Okay. Sure. Sure. I feel like I saw something on the news last night that some doctors released uh, recommendations for young people uh, for screen time, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that that's going to play into like all these streaming services wanting us to purchase them um, and then there's going to be so many of them, and then you have like, you know, other people in the medical field and whatnot saying like, this mm -hmm. isn't even okay for us to be. Yeah, especially for kids, especially right. for kids. And Netflix, Netflix has a huge, you know, that's a yeah. big part of their brand is they got all these original shows for kids. You know? Right, and like, a lot of these services they target children. Like they want, yeah. like, oh yeah, we're gonna have like little Einsteins, like right. so well, cool. There you go, Disney. Exactly. You know, that's like, that's a big show for Disney for you know really young audiences with baby Einstein and stuff. And that's guaranteed to be on their platform. And I was reading to the other, er, uh, when I was doing my research about Comcast. Comcast um, owns like a third of Hulu because AT and T just pulled out, um, and so. Like, just looking at all these different companies having yeah. shares or, like, owning part of the yeah. streaming services, yeah. like, there's already their whole thing going on, and then it's just so much, yeah. it's too much shit. It, so, well, I agree with you on that, too. The, the, the ownership, the intricacies of media ownership, I mean, you know... It's, it's easy enough to say Disney owns everything, but then when you dig in and you find out they own half of something with a competitor that they're, you know, at the global level, they're locked in this death, death match, and yet they both own bits and pieces of lots of other stuff together, you know? Right, Disney and it's owns kind of crazy. of Hulu, mm -hmm. now that AT&T pulled out, so it's... And they're starting their own streaming right. services, like, you know, as everyone was reporting on, so... And then they did this merger with Fox, so there's, like, they're just doing too... There's a lot of shit. So here's a question for everybody. You know, given, given you were saying we don't have enough time to watch all of it, and Chris was saying it's getting to be almost as expensive as a cable bill, do you think all of these can survive? No. No. no probably, uh, not. probably two or three. Probably two yeah. or three. Right? Yeah. They say more. They say most people nowadays are subscribed to two, and the industry is trying to get get us to subscribe to three. Okay. So that's the push right now. Uh, most yeah. people right. subscribe to more than one. So we might see more consolidation or more kind of you know co cooperation. Let's say like you're talking about. You know, if you're in Hulu, we'll also give you Showtime or Stars or something for an extra couple of bucks. Or if you're on Amazon, you can get through Amazon, you can get HBO and something else. But you so do have to pay for it. You do have to pay a little extra. Which yeah. I'm actually going to do because I have Amazon Prime and Netflix and HBO now. But HBO, um, like, super compresses all their streaming quality. Oh, so really? it's like blacks look like pixelated, oh, like a mess. Through Apple TV and Roku and all that stuff. So, but if you do it through Amazon, it's they like blow it up and make it much better. <laughs> I don't all know the increase. Okay. I don't know why HBO uh, do that, but. Okay. Um, so, this is too complicated, I think, for the average consumer, probably. Yeah. You know, which in in some ways is good for them because they'll think, well, this is going to encourage loyalty if it's too much of a hassle to reconfigure every little part of your streaming. You know. But uh, uh, so, so there is a way that the early expectation that, oh, finally we're free from the cable bundle. Yeah. Those, those thousand cable channels, half of which are owned by Viacom, which nobody wanted anyway, now we don't have to get them all the time. And yet it seems like we'll soon be subscribing to services where 90% of the content we don't care about. Or, and we, you know, that 10% that is something we do care about. It starts to begin to look like cable again, maybe, maybe, you know. 
companies, I think the consumer choice might limit to, in the heaven is different, of course, even on your interest, how much time you can really watch it. Yeah. And yeah, there's not enough attention. What would you pay for it? I think one last thing most people might, might, might forget is the platform is changing. Not just besides cell phone, the old TV set, mm -hmm. it's also games. Touchpad, yeah. <laughs> and, and video game, those hardware gadgets. For me, I know I definitely won't be able to watch any program at all from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. at least after school is done or work is done. Mm. So what do I, what choice I have? Cell phone, maybe half an hour news, 7, 7.30. And if I want to watch anything after 10, 11 p.m. while I'm lying down, I have to have a gadget, which is a touchpad mm -hmm. or Xbox or I want to go for Amazon because mm -hmm. it's, you know, pen. Yeah, so all those different platforms but make I, it I, I it's complicated for them that are trying to meet your needs. I think right? I also um, I think they don't they don't expect us to watch all of it. Uh -huh. They want us to say like, we have the op like a lot of us feel like we want the option to be able to watch something uh -huh. and we don't watch it. I, I do that a lot. I'm like, I want the option to watch the show. It's like backed up on my DVR. It's like 20 right. episodes. I'm like, oh my god, I'm not gonna get to that. <laughs> That's true. But people like having the option even though they're not gonna watch it. So they might subscribe to like you know. YouTube or, or the Apple service, and they, oh, I have all the Disney shows, but I'm not watching it, but I have the choice to watch it if I want to. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. One day when I have kids, I'll want to see those. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, yeah. One day, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I did, I saw, you know, just researching for all this as well, I noticed an article saying that YouTube, you know, the last I heard about was YouTube Red, where they were doing original series, and they hired an executive who had worked at the CW and she was like uh, uh, developing shows for them and now I hear they've dropped YouTube Red, they're calling it YouTube Premium and they're getting out of producing that kind of competitive programming. So, you know, one interpretation of that is they might have taken a look at, you know, Apple going for this and Netflix already doing it, Amazon putting in billions and saying, hell, you know, we, we don't, you know, you, we've got a great thing going on with YouTube in terms of shorter form, user generated content, gigantic exposure to advertising. Maybe it's not uh, going to be our, a good part of our business to start producing half hour sitcoms and go head to head with those other three companies that we mentioned. So I found that interesting, you know, just to see you know, that they've got all the, you know, Google sells. Ten billion dollars of advertising every year. You know they've got the money to go in and compete that way, but it seems like they said, "No, that's not our core." So it's just interesting to see them dip in the water and then say, "Oh, oh, oh too hot here. Let's get out. Smart. Do what we do." Yeah, you know, call it call it quits when you can. So uh, I hope you're all inspired by that topic, but of course there are the other ones that were up there already, and so let me just run through them very quickly for you. So the second one was to uh, basically uh, take a look at three very different television shows, look at the advertising that you see on them, list some of the ads that you're seeing on each of those shows, and try to explain why those ads are there based on the target audience. So if you're looking at a show that targets young people and you're seeing lots of ads for uh, you know, products that would basically appeal, then that's gold. That's what you want to kind of outline there. And you don't have to account for every ad that you see uh, because it says identify trends. And so basically, you know, well, here's a rerun of, uh, I don't know, home improvement or something. And uh, I see a lot of, you know, uh, hardware stores uh, advertising here. So terrific. You know, it's for older people. Uh, it's dealing with home improvement and stuff, and you're seeing hardware stores. So it's that kind of connection that you want to be able to make. So that might interest you. If you're more interested in, you know, the current fortunes of radio, then there's the question, the prompt about XM Sirius. Um, so uh, that might be useful for you if you like that. Uh, a biography of a local radio station. So if you're into, you know, not satellite radio, but a local station. Uh, this one can be done very effectively, starting out with the Wikipedia entry for the station, because they track in pretty exhaustive detail 
all of the format and ownership changes that a particular station will go through. So it is hard to get an FCC license for a station, but you're not tied to any particular format. So that means you often have stations that have been around you know, 50, 60 years because the license is established and it's a valuable thing, but it goes through ownership changes, it goes through format changes. Uh, so you'll have a, a, a station with a long history uh, and this is really just, you know, to go through it and check out the, you know, major changes. Uh, and feel free to give the station a call uh, and you'll be surprised at how quickly you can talk to somebody in community relations who might give you, you know, the latest about the station. It's like, well, who are your competitors or where's your focus? I mean, we hear that radio is going local. What are you doing to promote local uh, community on your station? That, that could be interesting, and I, I think you'll find easy enough to give the call, you know, give the front desk a call and talk to somebody who will give you a couple of quotes or something. So that could be fun. And what, you know, uh, next one. Uh, <laughs> so social networking and news. Um, so that's a very hot topic currently, so you may be interested in that. And then the final option, right, you're only writing about one. Uh, it's about kids stuff, and we even mentioned it today. Uh, but here's just a, a, a chance to uh, uh, think about some of the beneficial aspects of even relatively commercial children's programming. So we all you know, think that uh, Sesame Street or even Phineas and Ferb are, is probably you know, pretty good for your kids. Uh, but is SpongeBob? Uh, and so you may want to look through it and talk about how it you know, provides uh, positive themes for young people to learn from, even if it's not on PBS, you know, which is where you expect all that stuff to be. So, uh, so that's possible, especially if you have kids, you see more of this stuff than you could ever, ever imagine existed. You know? So um, and you, may, you may want a chance to write about it. So one of those topics, four pages, May 9th, I look forward to seeing it, and remember, these essays are worth so gigantically much of your grade that you really have to get something in. So if you're a perfectionist and you struggle just with like putting it in, put something in anyway, okay? Because um, you, you can't survive not doing this. So <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you all for your presentations. It was fun to see you all and to realize that uh, there are more people in this class than I expect to see all the time. <laughs> it's reassuring. Uh, and so uh, next time I'll see you will be your final exam time, and we'll publicize that well in advance, of course. Uh, but next time you see us, it'll be. Next time I see the people who oh, I don't okay. usually see. <laughs> I was uh, like, wait. The whole time. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Next time we all need to get together again for a mandatory meeting will be the final exam. Yeah, otherwise, I hope to see everyone as often as possible in class. It makes it more interesting. Very nice.